Okay. So, we've got a whole bunch of moving parts in this system. We were talking about a lake last week. A little bit more about what goes into any of this. Right? Every park, every wildlife refuge, every like dog walking field. Um, there's one over on the west end of Carbondale by the Unitarian Church, uh, run by the city of Carbondale. It's just a fenced in area, it's a field, it's mowed, it's got a bunch of dog like way area stuff installed there. It's a nice little spot. All of these, that all across all these different scales and all the different kinds of people working to run each one. They're all butted up against each other. So a big part of forest recreation management, whether you're a ranger or superintendent or gal mowing the lawns or the guy painting the chalk lines on the soccer fields or whatever, a huge piece of this is how do you work with your neighbors? Because recreation and habitat management and watershed management, all the different things we ask of our forests, all of these things require transboundary management. Okay? If we have a shooting range right next to a kid's playground owned by two different organizations. Those organizations better have their stories straight and be working together, right? Because if something goes wrong on either one of those, it's not just on the gun range owners. It's also on the playground folks to make sure that there is functional fencing in place on their side to keep kids who may be too young to realize any better that it's a bad idea to wander over onto the shooting range. Okay. So this in park management is referred to in the research and the professional development literature as do parks make good neighbors? And this is a relatively new area of discussion in the past about 20, 25 years. It's pretty new, right? Forestry, we're working on pretty long timelines for a lot of things. 50 year crop rotations for lumbering operations. But do parks make good neighbors? On the one hand, we've got situation where, let's say, it's getting harder and harder to own property these days, which is more and more expensive, but let's say you save up a down payment on a place, uh, kind of at the edge of, uh, edge of town to the south here, and um, you buy, buy this house and beyond it is you know, just sort of undeveloped land, and you buy it for, let's say, 150000 bucks. And then three years later, the United States Forest Service announces we've just closed a deal to buy up all of this land and add it to what is currently Shawnee National Forest. And the edge of what they're adding, that annexation, that expansion of Shawnee National Forest, goes right up to the back edge of your backyard. What do you think happens to your property value? Does it go up? Because it's now a national forest behind you, it goes down. What do you think? Is it a good thing or a bad thing to have a national forest as your behind your yard neighbor? So this is kind of how it goes. Typically speaking, when like a national forest or a national park or a wilderness area is designated uh, kind of real close to your property, like pushing up against it, your property value usually goes into orbit. Like big 
hockey stick of a graph on value. Because if it's a national forest behind you now, what probably can't go in behind you is a gigantic landfill or a huge, you know, uh, surface or pit mine with a whole bunch of like incredibly toxic, like super fun billion dollar cleanup level acid mine drainage, stuff like that. And people are willing to pay to buy that house, that property from you at a much higher price because they have some peace of mind. The federal government isn't going to open up a bunch of toxic sites in a national park, right? And at the same time, now you got to work with or you have to accept how the Forest Service works with you, right? In Soviet Russia, national forests enjoy you, right? Uh, this is the kind of thing where this could go really well. And on the Shawnee, it has gone really well for some people, and it has gone very badly for some people. Does anybody know the story of how the Shawnee National Forest was created and why it was created? Super important stuff. All right, let's talk about land use history for a sec. All right, so think back to around the year 1900. We have, or we are very soon to have, a forest preserve system. It's not the national forest system. We don't have a United States Forest Service yet in the year 1900, but we're close. It's coming real soon. Now. But Congress is already seeing that as of 1890. The Wild West is no longer wild. The frontier is closed. It's all now mapped out territories that have been parceled out, taken from Native Americans, given out to a bunch of, you know, Western settlers, stuff like that. And around the year 1900, we start as a country to see, oh my gosh, there's a whole bunch of resource extraction, clear cutting timber, for example, open pit mining, stuff like that. Um, hunting out passenger pigeons, right, carrier pigeons. Um, some of these pigeon species went down from billions of population in like 1850, 1875, down to zero. We hunted out pigeons to extinction to feed places like Chicago, the growing city of what's now 6 million plus people, okay? So we as a country are starting to realize around the year 1900, man, we can, we can go a little bit too hard on turning our natural resources into monetary resources, doing conversion from one to the other through extraction, logging, mining, etc. And so we get the United States National Forest System set up under Richard Pichot shortly after 1900. But Shawnee National Forest doesn't exist yet and won't exist for a long time. In fact, um, at that time, what is now Shawnee National Forest was a whole bunch of Southern Illinois bluff country farms. And if any of you guys, we have one or a couple of people who grow up on farms here. Yeah, okay. Uh, farming on steeper soils is hard to keep up. In Southern Illinois, we have uh, a couple of dominant soil types. Uh, we, we call it like Alford Silk Loam Peoria Lus. Uh, Lus is a very fine, powdery kind of soil. Those of you who haven't had a chance to take soil yet, some soils yet. Um, it's kind of the consistency of baby powder. Uh, those of you who have talk powder. Uh, it's very lightweight, and the lenses of Peoria Lus that we have across Southern Illinois aren't Southern Illinois native generated soils. They're actually blown over from places like Missouri. The wind picks it up as Eolian soil transport and just dumps it on Southern Illinois as the wind slows down after some windstorms and stuff like that. Okay. So it's easy for that soil to get transported here. It's easy for that soil to get transported away from here. So by, by the 1920s or so, this area is fully tamed. Southern Illinois is a whole bunch of farmland that's getting farmed pretty hard. As you all know, Illinois soils 
highly productive for corn and soy and stuff like that, right? We can grow stuff really well here. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have ideas like cover cropping, uh, soil retention practices, uh, regenerative farming was not yet a thing, uh, at least in the Western mindset. And so the 1930s hit, like the Great Depression, yeah? So uh, people are already struggling pretty hard. And we also get the Dust Bowl during that time. Uh, the American Dust Bowl is about an 80-year climactic cycle, 85-year uh, climactic cycle, um, kind of starting in the West and percolating all the way to the East. So when the Dust Bowl happens, places as far East as Boston are getting dust storms, their soils, from places like Southern Illinois, which is a long distance to lose your soils across. Yeah? It's just gone. It blows out over the Atlantic Ocean, and that soil is gone forever. Now, the same thing happens today in a positive way. Believe it or not, a whole bunch of the fertilization that keeps the Amazon the most vibrant and oxygen-producing ecosystem on terrestrial planet, uh, the dry land surface of the earth, one in five breaths of oxygen that you breathe are produced by the Amazon. And the Amazon is primarily fertilized by dust blown across the Atlantic the other way from the Sahara. Okay? So, wind transport of soils can happen on a, like a planetary scale. And what happened with Southern Illinois soils on a planetary scale during the dust bowl of the 1930s and early 1940s is um, during some of these storms, farms here in Southern Illinois, like single digit miles from where you're sitting right now, they would have gullies. So erosion ditches from storms open up in a single storm event and become six feet deep. There are file photos in the archives at Shawnee National Forest headquarters that show before and after photographs of some of these depression era farms where there's like somebody's like steam powered tractor. You know that was a thing back in the 30s. The steam powered tractor just like parked by the barn. And then 24 hours later, the tractor's still there, but you can't see it anymore because it's in a six foot deep ditch that opened up that night, right? Now if you're a farmer and you're getting six foot deep erosion gullies in your fields like in a matter of hours, because we're not doing stuff like cover cropping, regenerative farming, terrestrial or contour farming, stuff like that, like that's a hard way to be. That's a hard way to live. And so a lot of farms collapsed at that time. Literally. <laughs> yeah. And so the government started buying up farms from people so that they wouldn't starve. They'd say, hey, we'll pay you X number of dollars for this farm that is not really working anymore. The nutrient value of these soils has collapsed, we're not producing much, and we're losing what soil we do have on them. We'll give you fair market value for this farm, and you can, you know, take your family, maybe move to a nearby city like Carbondale, and up a new livelihood, right? So this is very much the era in American history where folks are moving from farms to cities. And that has not really stopped ever since then. Um, it's been kind of a slow trickle, but a continuous migration from less developed areas to more urban areas. So, all this to say, the federal government kind of swooped in to buy a bunch of these farms and some folks really needed that lifeline. Like that, that social safety net that the government provided saved a lot of people's lives from starvation and long-term malnutrition and stuff like that. Right? So if you're, if you're a farmer and you have a bunch of very little kids and you can't feed them properly, the rest of those kids' lives is going to be changed in a negative way because your body needs certain nutrients at certain times during development, puberty, stuff like that. 
Um, so like brain development doesn't happen fully. It's just sort of arrested development uh, in a much less funny way than the TV show of the same name um, for folks of just extreme poverty and malnutrition. So that was a very important thing for us to help take care of our fellow Americans in that way, provide that social safety net. So the Civilian Conservation Corps is in this area doing a bunch of stuff, building things like Giant City Lodge and a bunch of uh, trails in what is now such a nature, um, and so on and so forth. And another piece of this is to take a bunch of those hill farms that folks were just seeing collapse and their families, you know, kind of withering away, and puts them together into what will become Shawnee National Forest. And Works Progress Administration, Civilian Conservation Corps, a lot of these sort of labor organizations uh, put together by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 30s during that Great Depression. Um, they come in and plant a whole bunch of trees. Unfortunately, a lot of it is non-native pine, and we're still paying for that decision today, but we're doing it on a kind of an emergency basis, like planting millions of pine seedlings just to get something that is quick growing that will stabilize the soil with that root water because those farms have destabilized the soil by removing land cover. Right? That's kind of how farming works. You peel off everything that's trying to grow there and then you grow stuff there. So uh, that's kind of how we come to get Shawnee National Forest. So save a lot of lives in creating Shawnee National Forest. Go team. Big pat on the back. We're from the government, we're here to help. The problem is not everybody was on board with that. Some folks were like, actually, our farm is kind of doing okay. We're a little bit more sheltered from the wind or some of these rain events. Like, we're, we're struggling, but we're making it. So we're going to stay right here. And in some cases, they were allowed to stay there. So to this day, the Shawnee National Forest has some holes or patches in its larger outer perimeter called inholdings or enclaves. And... Uh, federal government in some cases sort of worked out some kind of a plan with those folks, like a 99 year lease, or to the end of the life of the last person um, that owns the land when that deal is signed. So when that person passes away, or 99 years later, whichever comes first, um, then that farm just gets automatically absorbed into Shawnee National Forest as federal property. Stuff like that. So for the folks who didn't want to participate in this grand vision of land reclamation and soil stabilization that the Shawnee National Forest was created for. It's not really great that the United States Forest Service uh, swooped in and was given authority to do all this stuff. Like, you know, we're doing okay, we're working hard, and now the government's saying, no, you have to leave now, because everybody else around you has, and we need this to be a continuous forest because we're going to do things like wildland fire management and we can't burn around your property. We're going to burn through it, for example. Question? So are most of the forests here, like how much of it was it, is it old growth or is it all pretty much like old farm fields? All right. Anybody have an answer to that? Most of it's old farm fields. In fact, in fact, if you look at Shawnee National Forest, from like a super, super long distance way out in space, sort of shaped ish like this, not to scale. <clears throat> There's what, five or six wilderness areas inside of Shawnee National Forest, which is a little bit exceptional uh, on the high side. But a couple of those wilderness areas are like right here. So Bald Knob and uh, Clear Springs wilderness areas over on the western edge, so inspiration points right about here, Bald Knob Cross would be like here, uh, Carbondale up here-ish. And if you go backpacking in uh, Bald Knob or Clear Springs wilderness area uh, areas, to this day, uh, there are like farm equipment, farm parcels with like trees growing up through like a combine harvester. Where is that? Um, so like the Odie Bridgman farm uh, is right about here. 
and like you're just you're walking through a forest, right? It's been a minute since you know Shawnee National Forest was established in this area, um, and all around it, outside, like right outside the parcel, it's all farmland um, and small towns. But like Shawnee National Forest wasn't mostly a forest at the time. You're exactly right. Again, it was really legitimately created from a whole bunch of farms where we erased the dividing lines between the farms and said this larger parcel is now a national forest, east or west district. Okay, so are parks good neighbors? Yeah, for a lot of people. And really bad neighbors for others. Uh, one other real quick example of how, um, in this case, the national park system can be um, understood as a good thing and a bad thing. Has anybody ever been on a cruise in the Caribbean? I have not. Maybe someday. I don't know. Cruise ships are pretty, pretty extra. All right. So there's this island, <coughs> island in the Caribbean. Excuse me. Called Saint John. Anybody heard of Saint John? All right, it's a U.S. minor outlying territory. It's not a state. Um, it's just like an island that the United States has taken over. And on that island, there are native populations of folks. Um, I don't know if they're specifically Caribbean natives, but uh, folks of the Caribbean name. Um, but it would be a people group like that. Um, they've lived on those islands for many, many, many years. And, um, you know, this is America, so we create national parks. There is a national park on the island of St. John. And uh, there are national parks not run by the United States in places like Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, where instead of displacing farmers and getting paid, you know, the fair market value of the land, Sometimes it's indigenous peoples who have, let's say, their village is here, and they've always gone to this like, mountainous forested area to harvest the wood that they need to run their cook fires every day, so they can boil water so they don't die of explosive uncontrollable diarrhea, like you know, amoeba dysentery or something like that. All right, all the stuff that gets you in Oregon Trail. If you ever played that old game? When you turn this into a national park, as has been done on St. John and some of these other parks run by Central American countries, um, all of a sudden, like the village doesn't move, it's not inside the national park, but where they were hunting for food, where they were gathering firewood to make their water safe to drink, it's now a federal crime to do those things. It's now tree poaching instead of gathering firewood. Does that make sense? All right. So, it's not automatically a thing that people should be happy when a national park or national forest or wildlife refuge, any of this stuff is created. Now, generally speaking on balance, we set aside any of these areas and the economic activity skyrockets. There are a lot of local businesses that now make their entire living providing services to visitors on the Shawnee. Hunting guides, trail riding outfitters and guides, bed and breakfast organizations that specifically market, hey, you can walk out the back lawn behind your little cabin here for the weekend and you're on the Shawnee National Forest and it's dozens and dozens of miles of really, really high quality trails and so on and so forth we're going to charge you a little bit extra because you have access to that opportunity. You don't even need to get in your car to enjoy this national forest, right? A lot of economic activity happens when you set aside an area for a more restricted use, like a national forest or a national park, or like a local or state park, something like that. It's all, it's all gravy on that side of things. But then you got all of that close more people there. Yeah. Yeah, you do. So that National Park in St. John, that sounds like a pretty nice spot for cruises to stop by. 
Acadia National Park, where we visited uh, this summer on summer camp off the coast of Maine, is very much um, a couple, three, four, five times a week. They'll get um, full-size cruise ships, you know, Carnival, Disney, whatever, uh, stopping by the Deepwater Harbor at Bar Harbor and dropping off three to five thousand people in an hour and just swarm the national park for a couple of hours and then they're back on the ship and they continue up you know towards Canada or back down towards Boston or Philadelphia wherever the uh, trip is originating from and like that's that's super fun if you're on that cruise, right? I mean, maybe you take a cruise to Alaska and you um, swing by any of the many national parks, wildlife refuges along the coast of southern Alaska. You know, you're there at each of those for an hour or two, five hours, six hours. You get to go sea kayaking among the grizzly bears, stuff like that. And then you're back on the ship and enjoying your all-you-can-eat buffet and the dinner show and the kids are off the other end of the ship in child care and you can finally relax and breathe and think for a minute. It's nice. But for the people living in those places, they're dealing with three to five thousand visitors showing up two, three, four, five times a week and just swarming where you live, where you're trying to do stuff, where you're trying to just exist. And maybe your livelihood as a local is tied to that tourism industry. And you can make some pretty good money. Uh, cruises through the Caribbean uh, generate just absolutely stupefying amounts of economic activity that is not otherwise possible on some of these small tropical islands. It's just well, they're small and hard to have heavy industry on, for example. Uh, and relatively wealthy Americans showing up for a couple of hours spending what feels like a couple of bucks to Americans is a lot of money in some other economies, right? So, if we, my wife and I have traveled to Japan this past uh, winter, uh, the yen is pretty soft against the dollar, and so we're having like gourmet level stuff, like five star restaurant level stuff for a not five star restaurant price. Um, after the conversion from dollars to yen and stuff like that. Pretty cool. So, all this to say, it's not automatically perfect, right? And this, this kind of tracks with our understanding, our, our beginning understanding of what it's like to work in forest management, forest rec management, any of this stuff. There's always a trade-off involved, right? We can kind of have a high tide that floats all ships economically in the area when we set up a national park or a national forest or whatever else but there's going to be some kind of a cost to it as well, right? Lots of traffic congestion, seasonal. Lots of tourists behaving badly in certain cases. Um, like, look at coastal Florida. There are lots of cities in coastal Florida that literally ban people from visiting for spring break. Think about how much money the entire country worth of college age folks looking to party on spring break down in Florida. Think about how much money that could bring to Florida. And some of these towns are sick of that bullshit and they're not putting up with it anymore. You know? So there's always a trade-off involved. And that doesn't mean anybody is being like actively evil or anything. It's just trade-offs, right? To get this benefit, we gotta be willing to put up with such and such a cost. Hopefully the benefit is much higher than the cost. But the cost is not shared equally among everybody. It tends to land a little bit harder on lower socioeconomic status folks who can't afford to move away from that congestion and over the top partying um, and all of that stuff. And it tends to fall on po folks with uh, a little bit less political clout to keep it out of their own backyards. Okay? So, all this to say, the mosaic. Mosaic is big and complex, has a lot of different moving parts. Just within the federal chunk of that previous slide, right, we can expand that one bullet point out into all of these and classify them further as resource extractive agencies and operations 
and non-resource extracted. So another way to say this might be a conservation-based approach where resource extraction is okay as long as it's sustainable, right? We have this utilitarian mindset of the greatest good for the most people for the longest period of time. We need forests to produce timber into perpetuity forever, right? There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's well managed. We have a lot of ideas about that in the forestry department here, right? And then there are non-resource extractive agencies and organizations that map onto preservation, where we're trying to run those ecosystems as they are, or as they could be, helping them, you know, managing them to realize their maximum natural or pre-disturbance potential and integrity and structure and function and species composition, all that stuff. So one positive outcome of all of these trade-offs that we got to make and all these trade-offs we got to do in order to have this complex mosaic system of federal next to state, next to private land, next to industry, next to not-for-profit owned land like the Nature Conservancy. Okay. One of the positive benefits for you guys and gals is there's a lot more organizations to apply to than just the United States Forest Service. It was just announced the other day that the United States Forest Service is canceling 100% of all of its temp seasonal hiring other than fire hire for the next 12 months. That's like tens of thousands of jobs that you guys and gals would normally be applying to. So when an announcement like that comes out, like, hey, the fire spend is going to take up literally the entire budget of this entire federal agency for the next year, you're not screwed. If you want to get a job in forestry next summer as a student, that's just one entry on a pretty big set of lists. And this is just the federal stuff, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about some of these so you guys have a clearer sense of man, what can I do next summer to start building my resume instead of going back home and working at the, the snack shack at our local swim club for the summer? Start building that resume. We have, for our consumptive side of things, again, resource extraction, okay. The goal is conservation, not preservation, and a function, uh, functional emphasis on... Uh, high quality ecosystem services. We are running national forests on purpose like a factory to produce board feet of timber, acres of rangeland, acre feet of drinkable water, watershed management, and mineral extraction. And we can't go 100% on any one of those, but we can go like maybe 95% on all of them together. Does that make sense? Again, trade-offs, okay? So, things like resource extraction, obviously nothing wrong with that. We need board feet of timber. This is one trimming diagram of how a tree on the stump gets turned into toilet paper and paper and houses. Right. Lots of products we can get off of these. On the non-consumptive side, we're looking at absolutely a philosophical difference. It is purely a human decision based on human values of this place is a park that we're going to preserve and the area right next to it is a forest that we're going to use as sustainably and as hard as we can. Okay, for extracting resource values out of it. The values that we are satisfying or extracting out of a place that is managed for preservation are going to be things like <coughs> recreation values, scientific benchmarking value, things like existential value, which you'll hear a little bit more about in stuff like social influences, of course. Um, where it matters to some people that Shawnee National Forest exists. Whether or not some people 
get to go to Shawnee National Forest, it's important that they know that we have national forests. Not just for the drinking water, not just for the board feet of timber, the fact that it exists at all. Right? So the wilderness areas inside of Shawnee National Forest, wilderness areas are managed for preservation. And the national forest wrapped around those wilderness areas managed for conservation. So we're not doing any extraction of timber in a place that is set aside for preservation. And the preservation value is compatible with stuff like backpacking, right? We were talking about backpacking through uh, Clear Springs, Bald Knob, wilderness areas, and visiting the old Odie Bridgman farm site, and it's super creepy. Like, yeah, it's sort of this liminal space of, wow, people used to be here, and uh, Odie Bridgman was there until the 90s. He had owned that place since the Great Depression, um, before he passed away. So, resource extraction. You guys will learn more about this in all of your forestry classes, right? Multiple use sustained yield is the explicit mission of the United States Forest Service. So, according to these, this is what you're doing. all of these things as a forest protection officer, as a timber specialist, as a range manager, as any of the different job titles and functional roles with the Forest Service under conservation. And again, inside of that space, we can have wilderness areas which are designated for preservation, just like a national park is. Okay. Other kinds of resource extractive organizations include the Tennessee Valley Authority, which has a whole bunch of eastern rivers, like the Gully River, the Yakahini River, places like West Virginia, which is very mountainous in the Appalachians, to try and get first electricity to eastern Tennessee, eastern Kentucky, eastern Ohio, places that in the 1930s and 1940s where most people were still living in log cabins, right, in the early 1900s. That is not at all uncommon at that time in that area because it's mountainous, it's difficult to get uh, more advanced services out there and stuff like that. So in the 1930s, we start building these huge, huge hydroelectric projects out west, Hoover Dam, Glen Canyon Dam, and then out east with the Yakahani and so forth. So, Tennessee Valley Authority set up during the Great Depression, just like the Civilian Conservation Corps, just like the Works Progress Administration, but not so much to employ a whole bunch of people for the sake of having Americans not starve to death. It was more, let's build dams and hydropower projects and electrify rural eastern United States. The Bureau of Reclamation does the same thing huge water projects out west, turning essentially desert in the American Southwest to marginally less desert, because we can pump water and flow water through canals uh, all over the place. And that is why, uh, partially why, we have a huge, huge, huge emphasis on cheap beef in the United States, to the point that we're logging the Amazon to the point of collapse to have cheap Brazilian beef flown in so we can have our um, our Big Macs for, gosh, they're like 15 bucks now for the whole meal. It's crazy. But even that is heavily, heavily, heavily subsidized by your tax dollars. In the same way that our gasoline is very cheap in the United States relative to everywhere else in the world because we subsidize that stuff as hard as we can. So federal level agencies between these two, this is like double digit proportions of entire western states run by reclamation and so forth, all right? Fish and Wildlife Service is kind of straddling that conservation, preservation sense of things, right? So the big six for Fish and Wildlife Service as created by Congress back in the day, hunting and fishing, extractive consumptive recreation use, or extractive consumptive subsistence use, meaning a lot of people feed themselves year-round on what they catch on a wildlife refuge. 
They don't have to buy it in the store, right? You take a couple of deer, fill up your deep freeze, and you're having venison all year long. And venison, if God wanted us to be vegetarians, why did he make deer so tasty? Okay. But there are also non-consumptive forms of human use or values or kind of the mission, like wildlife observation, like nature photography, right? You can have a million wildlife photographers cycling through um, Crab Orchard Wildlife Refuge, taking photos with big, long telephoto lenses of those beautiful bald eagles, and the bald eagles don't care, right? The impact of being around humans has already happened with the first dozen people. So the remaining 999,988 people, not really an issue for the eagles. So non-consumptive value, non-consumptive use. And then of course, education and environmental interpretation, helping the general public understand why do we care about bald eagles? What do we do to functionally care about bald eagles as our national bird and all of the other species, right? Why, as a pregnant person, do you need to not eat too many fish each month out of Crab Orchard Lake? Helping folks understand the land use history, things like World War II and ammunition production to uh, be sighted in the middle of the country in case Sichuomans ever make landfall at either of our coasts right? We tell that story and help folks understand not just like the textbook -y factoids of uh, this is the um, North American white-tailed deer, the Otocoelus virginiana. It is, uh, it is a crepuscular, warm-blooded mammal, right? That is textbook information. That's knowledge. That's data. That's factoids. There's no sense of value or understanding or meaning or importance behind those. It's just the Latin name and the winter pelt versus the summer coat and stuff like that. Interpretation is helping folks connect to what might be some wisdom or value beyond those factors. What does it mean to you and me that there are like world-class whitetail hunting opportunities here in Southern Illinois thanks to that corn and soy? What does that mean for us? Like, what does that mean for you and me culturally that we can wake up and fill our deep freezes during hunting season and that's not just calories, but it's also like experiences. It's like family memories together in the hunting blind. It's a whole bunch of different things for not just us, but also the Native American cultures who are in this area to this day, right? So one or a couple of um, forestry master students over the last couple of years have been working with um, some of the bigger tribes out west to work on blacktail and mule deer management in the semi-arid forests out there like the Fish Lake National Forest, Kaibab, Coconino National Forest, Dry, Pinion, Juniper, Ponderosa Pine, looking forests. Um, because blacktail deer are not just a source of calories, but like, If any of you guys grew up going to like a Christian, Protestant, Catholic church, um, we don't have a lot of emphasis or symbolism placed on specific animal species in that tradition, right? Christianity is literally from the other side of the planet. So, the species that are mentioned in the Bible, the Quran, the uh, Hebrew Bible, and stuff like that, they don't necessarily kind of hit with us in day to day living. But for somebody who's Navajo, blacktail, elk, stuff like that, they've been chilling with blacktail and elk for thousands of years. And so these species do have a meaning and significance beyond their caloric value. In the Pacific Northwest, um, entire tribes, cultures, are wrapped around specific subspecies of salmon. And it's easy for you and me, especially me, to just kind of drive right by a white-tailed deer and be like, oh, there's some venison steaks on the hoof over there, you know, so on and so forth. So forth, multiply, and tasty. 
and just like continue on with my day. But for somebody whose culture, their history, their creation stories specifically name those species, or even those subspecies, that's a big deal if something goes wrong, or if anybody else doesn't understand that significance. Is making land use decisions, like damming up some of these western rivers, that can totally destroy those salmon populations, right? So, damn a river wrong, destroy a fish population, and destroy a human culture as well, right? Cool. So, that's what interpretational is all about, and several of these organizations we'll finish up talking about later this week work on that as a function of what we do day to day in forestry. All right, cool. Let's end it right there. We got 30 seconds left for you to pack up. I'm here for questions if you have them. Otherwise, see you on Thursday. <laughs>